Okay, well, thank you for joining me this afternoon. I'm going to read some poetry. Now, I like poetry a lot, and I write poetry, and I love poetry. I have a lot of friends who say they don't like poetry, and if you look at some contemporary poems, you can see why they don't. It's as though they're trying to write in code for only special people to understand. But we're going to look at some narrative poems. Now, narrative poems are where poetry started. If you can imagine yourself, oh, however many thousands of years ago, sitting around the campfire, but nothing to do on a long evening, and whoever is the best storyteller in the tribe starts to recite the story of the last great hunt that your tribe had. Now, I'm joking, of course, but it's a story that you would know, that you would be familiar with, you would know the rhythms of. And this is what narrative poets are trying to do, to tell you a good story in a way that you will remember and be excited by the rhythm of the story as well as by the story itself. Now, some of the poems I'm going to read you are probably poems that you have heard before. I hope you have heard them before because they're really marvelous poems. And if you have heard them before, try to get caught up in the story again and see if you still like it as well as you did the first time. <clears throat> now, the first one I'm going to look at um, and read to you is How They Brought the Good News from Ghent to Axe by a poet named Robert Browning in the 19th century. Now, Browning is a, Browning is a great British poet. Uh, you probably, if you've known any Browning, you may know his lines about grow old along with me, the best is yet to be, but he wrote a lot better stuff than that. This particular poem, uh, he tried to say, he said he wanted to write it to sound like a galloping horse. So see if you can hear a galloping horse in this poem about galloping horses. How they brought the good news from Ghent to Axe. I sprang to the stirrup, and Joris and he, I galloped, dirt galloped, we galloped all three. Good speed, cried the watch as the gate bolts undrew. Speed echoed the wall to us galloping through. Behind shut the postern, the lanks sank to rest, and into the midnight we galloped abreast. Not a word to each other, we kept the great pace, neck by neck, stride by stride, never changing our place. I turned in my saddle and made its girth tight, then shortened each stirrup and set the peak right, rebuckled the cheek strap, chained slacker the bit, nor galloped less steadily Roland a whit. Twas moonset at starting, but while we drew near, Lochran the cocks crew, and sunrise dawned clear. At boom a great yellow star came to see, at Duffold twas morning as plain as could be, and from Melcham Church steeple we heard the half chime. So Joris broke silence with, yet there is time. At airshot, up leaped of a sudden the sun, against him the cattle stood black every one. To stare through the mist at us galloping past, and I saw my stout galloper, Roland at last, with resolute shoulders, each budding away the haze as some bluff river headland its spray, and his low head and crest, just one sharp ear bent back, for my voice and the other pricked out on his track, and one eye's black intelligence, ever that glance, or its white edge at me, his own master, askance. And the thick, heavy spoon flakes, which I and anon, his fierce lips shook upward and galloping on. By Hasselt, Dirk groaned and cried, Joris, stay spur. Your ruse galloped bravely, the fault's not in her. We'll remember at X. And for once, he heard the quick wheeze of her chest, saw the stretched neck and staggering knees, and sunk tail and horrible heave of the flank, as down on her haunches she shuddered and sank. So we were left galloping, Joris and I, past Luz and past Tongres, no cloud in the sky. The broad sun above laughed a pitiless laugh. Neath our feet broke the bright stubble like chaff, till over by Dalham a dome spire sprang white. And gallop, cried Joris, for axes in sight. How they'll greet us. And all in a moment his roan rolled neck and croup over, lay dead as a stone. And there was my Roland to bear the whole weight of the news which alone could save X from her fate. With his nostrils like pits full of blood to the brim, and with circles of eyes red for his eye sockets rim. Then I cast loose my greatcoat, each holster let fall, shook off both my jack boots, let go belt and all, stood up in the stirrup, leaned, patted his ear, called my Roland his pet name, my horse without peer, clapped my hands, laughed and sang, any noise, bad or good, till at length into X Roland galloped and stood. And all I remember is friends flocking round as I sat with his head twixt my knees on the ground, and no voice but was praising this Roland of mine as I poured down his throat our last measure of wine, which the Burgesses voted by common consent was no more than his due who brought the good news from Ghent. 
That poem is actually one of the very first ones ever recorded. Robert Browning recorded it himself late in the 19th century, not long before he died. And you can go to YouTube and Google this and hear the very scratchy reading of one of these very first poems they put on a wax cylinder, which is what they recorded in in those days. <clears throat> All right, in honor of the season, now, this is a, an American classic poem by a guy named Ernest Thayer, who I don't think ever wrote anything else. But, but this, is, this is one I feel sure you've heard, but I said it's an honor of the season, and it's an exciting poem from 1888. Casey at the Bat. The outlook wasn't brilliant for the Mudville Nine that day. The score stood four to two with but one inning left to play. And then when Cooney died at first and Barrows did the same, a sickly silence fell upon the patrons of the game. A straggling few got up to go in deep despair. The rest clung to the hope which springs eternal in the human breast. They thought, if only Casey could but get a whack at that, we'd put up even money now with Casey at the bat. But Flynn preceded Casey, as did also Jimmy Blake, and the former was a pudding and the latter was a flake. So upon that stricken multitude, grim melancholy set, for there seemed but little chance of Casey's getting to the bat. But Flynn let drive a single to the wonderment of all, and Blake, the much despised, tore the cover off the ball. And when the dust had lifted and they saw what had occurred, there was Jimmy safe at second and Flynn a hug and third. Then from 5,000 throats and more, there rose a lusty yell. It rumbled through the valley. It rattled in the dell. It pounded on the mountainside, recoiled upon the flat, for Casey, mighty Casey, was advancing to the bat. There was ease in Casey's manner as he stepped into his place. There was pride in Casey's bearing and a smile on Casey's face. And when, responding to the cheers, he lightly doffed his hat, no stranger in the crowd could doubt it was Casey at the bat. 10,000 eyes were on him as he rubbed his hands with dirt. 5,000 tongues applauded when he wiped them on his shirt. Then while the writhing pitcher ground the ball into his hip, defiance flashed in Casey's eye, a sneer curled Casey's lip. And now the leather-covered sphere came hurtling through the air, and Casey just stood watching it in haughty grandeur there. Close by the sturdy batsman, the ball unheeded sped, that ain't my style, said Casey. Strike one, the umpire said. Then from the benches black with people, there went up a muffled roar, like the beating of the storm wave on a stern and distant shore. Kill him, kill the umpire, shouted someone in the stand, and it's likely they'd have killed him had got Casey raised his hand. With a smile of Christian charity, great Casey's visage shone. He stilled the rising tumult. He bade the game go on. He signaled to the pitcher, and once more the dun sphere flew. But Casey still ignored it, and the umpire said, Strike two! Fraud! cried the maddened thousands, and the echo answered, Fraud! But one scornful look from Casey, and the audience was awed. They saw his face go stern and cold. They saw his muscles strain. They knew that Casey wouldn't let the ball go by again. The sneer is gone from Casey's lip. His teeth are clenched in hate. He pounds with cruel violence his bat upon the plate, and now the pitcher holds the ball, and now he lets it go, and now the air is shattered by the force of Casey's blow. Oh, somewhere in this favored land, the sun is shining bright. The band is playing somewhere, and somewhere hearts are light, and somewhere men are laughing, and somewhere children shout, but there is no joy in Mudville. Mighty Casey has struck out. You gotta love that poem. <clears throat> and sometimes uh, narrative poems are fairly short and more are fairly short and more complicated than just a story. As they get in the hands of more modern authors, they still retain that story element, but they retain sometimes they add in a wicked twist to them. Um, this is a poem by an American writer. You may know him of the Spoon River Anthology, which is a short bunch of short collection of story of poems by uh, Robinson about, about a town that he, that he knew and grew up. And this is one portrait that he wrote in a ballad form in 1897. It's called Richard Corey. Whenever Richard Corey went downtown, we people on the pavement looked at him. He was a gentleman from soul to crown, clean favored and imperially slim. 
And he was always quietly arrayed, and he was always human when he talked. But still he fluttered pulses when he said good morning, and he glittered when he walked. And he was rich, yes, richer than a king, and admirably schooled in every grace. In fine, we thought that he was everything to make us wish that we were in his place. And so on we worked and waited for the light, and went without the meat and cursed the bread. And Richard Corey, one calm summer night, went home and put a bullet through his head. <clears throat> now I'm going to take, take a little risk on you here. Um, there are some really good poets who are, I don't know, not to say they're not nice people, it's to say that their political views have gotten passed by time, and we don't like the way they thought about the world anymore. Um, and so we don't read their works much anymore. Now, one of those poets, writers, he wrote, he wrote novels and short stories as well as poems, is a, is a poet <clears throat> from the British colonial period named Rudyard Kipling. I'm sure you know Kipling. He's a, a well-known name. Kipling's political views are, are not what you'd want to, I mean, you read some of his fiction now and it makes you want to wince for some of the things he said. I mean, Kipling was the one who invented the term, the white man's burden. He was serious about his, his love of colonialism and what he thought the empire could do for the world. But there were times, there were times that Kipling got past his own bad political views. He really did love the people of India. And when he could get past thinking of politics and just think of human beings, he could write stuff that is not going to make, your, make you wince when you read it. Um, and he's such a good writer that I'm going to put in a poem here by him because it, it is a poem that is not politically offensive and it is a poem that's an awfully good poem. Um, it's, it's called The Ballad of East and West by Rudyard Kipling from 1889. And it starts out, Oh, east is east and west is west and never the twain shall meet till earth and sky stand presently at God's great judgment seat. But there is neither east nor west, border nor breed nor birth, when two strong men stand face to face, though they come from the ends of the earth. Camel is out with twenty men to raise the border side, and he has lifted the colonel's mare that is the colonel's pride. He has lifted her out of the stable door between the dawn and the day, and turned the calkins upon her feet and ridden her far away. Then up and spoke the colonel's son that led a troop of the guides. Is there never a man of all my men can say where Camel hides? Then up and spoke Mohammed Khan, the son of the Resseldar, if you know the tracks of the morning mist, you know where his pickets are. At dusk he harries the Abazai, at dawn he is into Bonaire, but he must go by Fort Buclo to his own place to fare. So if you gallop to Fort Buclo as fast as a bird can fly, by the favor of God ye may cut him off ere he win to the tongue of Jangai. But if he be past the tongue of Jangai, right swiftly turn ye then, for the length and the breadth of that ghastly plain is sown with camel's men. There is rock to the left and rock to the right and a low mean thorn between and ye may hear a breech bolt snick where never a man is seen. The colonel's son has taken a horse and a raw rough dun was he with the mouth of a bell and the heart of hell and the head of a gallows tree. The colonel's son to the fort has won, they bid him stay to eat. But he who rides the tail of a border thief, he sits not long at his meat. He's up and away from Fort Buclo as fast as he can fly till he was aware of his father's mare in the gut of the tongue of Jangai, till he was aware of his father's mare with camel upon her back, and when he could spy the white of her eye, he made his pistol crack. He has fired once, he has fired twice, but the whistling ball went wide. Ye see, you shoot like a soldier, camel said, show now if you can ride. It's up and over the tongue of Jangai, as blown dust devils go. The dun he fled like a stag of tin, but the mare like a barren doe. The dun he leaned against the bit and slugged his head above, but the red mare played with the snaffle bars as a maiden plays with a glove. There was rock to the left and rock to the right and a low lean thorn between, and thrice he heard a breech bolt snick, though never a man was seen. They have ridden the low moon out of the sky, their hoofs drum up the dawn. The dun he went like a wounded bull, but the mare like a new roused fawn. The dun he fell at a water course, in a woeful heap fell he, and camel has turned the red mare back and pulled the rider free. 
He has knocked the pistol out of his hand. Small room was there to strive. "'Twas only by favor of mine,' said he, "'you rode so, far, so long alive. "'There was not a rock for twenty miles. "'There was not a clump of tree, "'but covered a man of my own men "'with his rifle cocked on his knee. "'If I had raised my bridle hand "'as I have held it low, "'the little jackals that feast so fast "'were feasting all in a row. "'If I had bowed my head on my breast "'as I have held it high, "'the kite that whistles above us now "'were gorged till she could not fly.' Then lightly answered the colonel's son, Do good to bird and beast, but count who come for the broken meats before thou makest a feast. If there should follow a thousand swords to carry my bones away, belike the price of a jackal's meal were more than a thief could pay. They will feed their horse on the standing crop, their men on the garnered grain. The thatch of the buyers will serve their fires when all the cattle are slain. But if thou thinkest the price be fair, thy brethren wait to sup. The hound is kin to the jackal dog, howl dog, and call them up. And if thou thinkest the price be high in steer and gear and stack, then give me my father's mare again, and I'll fight my own way back. Kamal has gripped him by the hand and set him upon his feet. No talk shall be of dogs, says he, when wolf and gray wolf meet. May I eat dirt if thou hast hurt of me in deed or breath. What dam of lances brought thee forth to jest at the dawn with death? And lightly answered the colonel's son, I hold by the bud of my clan. Take up the mare for my father's gift. By God, she has carried a man. The red mare ran to the colonel's son and nuzzled against his breast. We be two strong men, said Camel then, but she loveth the younger best. So she shall go with a lifter's dower, my turquoise studded rein, my broidered saddle and saddle cloth, and stirrup, silver stirrup twain. The colonel's son a pistol drew and held it muzzle end. Ye have taken the one from a foe, he said. Will ye take the mate from a friend? A gift for a gift, said Camel straight, a limb for the risk of a limb. Thy father has sent his son to me, I'll send my son to him. With that he whistled his only son that dropped from a mountain crest. He trod the ling like a buck in spring, and he looked like a lance in rest. Now here is thy master, Camel said, who leads the troop of the guides, and thou must ride at his left hand as a shield on the shoulder rides, till death or I cut loose the tie at camp and board and bed. Thy life is his, thy fate it is to guard him with thy head. So thou must eat the white queen's meat, and all her foes are thine, and thou must harry thy father's hold for the peace of the border line, and thou must make a trooper tough and hack thy way to power. Belike they will raise thee to Resseldar when I am hanged in Peshawar. They have looked each other between the eyes, and there they found no fault. They have taken the oath of the brother in blood on leavened bread and salt. They have taken the oath of the brother in blood on fire and fresh-cut sod, on the hilt and the haft of the Khyber knife and the wondrous names of God. The colonel's son, he rides the mare, and Kamal's boy, the dun, and two have come back to Fort Buklo, where there went forth but one. And when they drew to the quarter guard, full twenty swords flew clear. There was not a man but carried his feud with the blood of the mountaineer. Have done, have done, said the colonel's son. Put up the steel at your sides. Last night ye had struck at a border thief. Tonight tis a man of the guides. Oh, east is east and west is west, and never the twain shall meet, till earth and sky stand presently at God's great judgment seat. But there is neither east nor west, border nor breed nor birth, when two strong men stand face to face, though they come from the ends of the earth. Yeah. Kipling is a really good writer. There are things of his that you can that you can still read without pain, and this is one of them that I'm really fond of. <clears throat> okay, this as I said, some as I, as I said earlier when I read the Robinson poem, some modern poets have taken the ballad or the, the narrative poem no, notion and and done more ironic and interesting things with it. Um, there's a poem I'm going to read you a poem by Robert Frost. Now, Robert Frost is, of course, a wonderful American poet, and, and probably everybody knows some of his best poems about the road not taken and stopping by woods on a snowy evening and uh, something there is that doesn't love a wall. But, but Frost had a really sort of bitter, ironic streak in him, too. And in this little short narrative poem, um, 
It's, it's pretty painful. It's, it's the, I, mean, I almost hate to read it to you because when the first time I read it, I had trouble getting the main image out of my head. So I sort of hate to do that to you because it's going to put an image in your head that you may not like to remember. But it's such a good poem. I think I'll take the risk anyway. <clears throat> okay, it's called Out, Out by Robert Frost. The buzzsaw snarled and rattled in the yard and made dust and dropped stove-length sticks of wood sweet scented stuff when the breeze drew across it and from there those that lifted eyes could count five mountain ranges one behind the other under the sunset far into vermont and the saw snarled and rattled snarled and rattled as it ran light or had to bear a load and nothing happened day was all but done call it a day i wish they might have said to please the boy by giving him the half hour that a boy counts so much when saved from work. His sister stood beside him in her apron to tell them it was supper. At the word the saw, as if to prove saws knew what supper meant, leapt out at the boy's hand, or seemed to leap, he must have given it the hand. However it was, neither refused the meeting, but the hand. The boy's first outcry was a rueful laugh as he swung toward them, holding up the hand, half in appeal, but half as if to keep the life from spilling. Then the boy saw all, since he was old enough to know, big boy doing a man's work, though a child at heart. He saw all spoiled. Don't let him cut off my hands, the doctor, when he comes. Don't let him, sister. So, but the hand was gone already. The doctor put him in the dark of ether, he lay and puffed his lips out with his breath, and then the watcher at his pulse took fright. No one believed. They listened at his heart. Little, less, nothing. And that ended it. No more to build on there. And they, since they were not the one dead, returned to their affairs. Now, that's a grim poem but a beautiful poem. Let's see what time it is. Okay. Now this is another one you, you may have heard, uh, you may have come across before. It's one I think that's probably in a lot of textbooks, but I doubt that you have looked at an English lit textbook in a lot of years. So you probably haven't seen this poem in a lot of years. Uh, it's another 20th century poem that a modern writer is making an old ballad into a, into a modern poem. It's called The Highwayman by Alfred Noyes. Uh, I see a couple people nodding, so people know this poem, yes. But you haven't heard it recently, though, have you? No. Okay, you can, you can hear it. The wind was a torrent of darkness among the gusty trees. The moon was a ghostly galleon tossed upon cloudy seas. The road was a ribbon of moonlight over the purple moor, and the highwayman came riding Riding, riding, the highwayman came riding up to the old inn door. He'd a French cocked hat on his forehead, a bunch of lace at his chin, a coat of the claret velvet, and breeches of brown doe skin. They fitted with never a wrinkle. His boots were up to the thigh, and he rode with a jeweled twinkle, his pistol butts a twinkle, his rapier hilt a twinkle under the jeweled sky. Over the cobbles he clattered and clashed in the dark inn yard. He tapped with his whip on the shutters, but all was locked and barred. He whistled a tune to the window, and who should be waiting there but the landlord's black-eyed daughter, Bess, the landlord's daughter, plaiting a dark red love knot into her long black hair. And dark in the old, dark inn yard, a stable wicket creaked, where Tim the ostler listened. His face was white and peaked. His eyes were hollows of madness, his hair like moldy hay, for he loved the landlord's daughter, the landlord's red-lipped daughter. Dumb as a dog, he listened, and he heard the robber say, One kiss, my bonny sweetheart, I'm after a prize tonight, but I shall be back with the yellow gold before the morning light. Yet if they press me sharply and harry me through the day, then look for me by moonlight. Watch for me by moonlight. I'll come to thee by moonlight, though hell should bar the way. He rose upright in the stirrups. He scarce could reach her hand, 
but she loosened her hair in the casement, his face burnt like a brand as the black cascade of perfume came tumbling over his breast, and he kissed its waves in the moonlight, oh, sweet black waves in the moonlight. Then he tugged at his rein in the moonlight, and they galloped, and galloped away to the west. He did not come in the dawning, he did not come at noon, and out of the tawny sunset before the rise of the moon, when the road was a gypsy's ribbon looping the purple moor, a redcoat troop came marching, marching, marching. King George's men came marching up to the old inn door. They said no word to the landlord. They drank his ale instead. But they gagged his daughter and bound her to the foot of her narrow bed. Two of them knelt at the casement with muskets at their side. There was death at every window and hell at one dark window for Bess could see through her casement the road that he would ride. They have tied her up to attention with many a sniggering jest. They had bound a musket beside her with the muzzle beneath her breast. Now keep good watch, and they kissed her. She heard the doomed man say, Look for me by moonlight, watch for me by moonlight. I'll come to thee by moonlight, though hell should bar the way. She twisted her hands behind her, but the knots all held good. She writhed her fingers, her hands, till her fingers were wet with sweat or blood. They stretched and strained in the darkness, and the hours crawled by like years, till now on the stroke of midnight, cold on the stroke of midnight, the tip of one finger reached it, the trigger at least was hers. The tip of one finger touched it, she strove no more for the rest. Up she stood at attention with the muzzle beneath her breast, she would not risk their hearing, she would not strive again, for the road lay bare in the moonlight, blank and bare in the moonlight, and the blood of her veins in the moonlight throbbed to her love's refrain. Tlot, 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 had they heard it, the hoofbeats ringing clear? Tlot, 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 in the distance, were they deaf that they did not hear? Down the ribbon of moonlight, over the brow of the hill, the highwayman came riding, 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 the redcoats looked to their priming. She stood up straight and still. Tlot, tlot in the frosty silence. Tlot, tlot in the echoing night. Nearer he came and nearer. Her face was like a light. Her eyes grew wide for a moment. She drew one last deep breath. Then her finger moved in the moonlight. Her musket shattered the moonlight, shattered her breast in the moonlight and warned him with her death. He turned, he spurred to the west, he did not know who stood, bowed with her head o'er the musket, drenched with her own blood. Not till the dawn he heard it, and his face grew gray to hear how Bess, the landlord's daughter, the landlord's black-eyed daughter, had watched for her love in the moonlight and died in the darkness there. Back he spurred like a man-mad, shrieking a curse to the sky, with the white road smoking beneath him and his rapier brandished high. Blood red were his spurs in the golden noon, wine red was his velvet coat, when they shot him down on the highway, down like a dog on the highway, and he lay in his blood on the highway with a bunch of lace at his throat. And still of a winter's night, they say, when the wind is in the trees, when the moon is a galleon, ghostly galleon tossed upon cloudy seas, when the road is a ribbon of moonlight over the purple moor, a highwayman comes riding, 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 a highwayman comes riding up to an old inn door. Over the cobbles he clatters and clangs in the dark inn yard. He taps with his whip on the shutters, but all is locked and barred. He whistles a tune to the window, and who should be waiting there but the landlord's black-eyed daughter, Bess, the landlord's daughter, plaiting a dark red love knot into her long black hair. I tell you, these poems are, these poems have a lot going for them. They're drama. Okay. Two more, not as, not long ones, but this one, again, is another, it's another narrative poem, but it's a different kind of narrative poem. Uh, it's a poem that's a dramatic monologue. That is, there's just one speaker. We don't know anything about the speaker or his situation except what he tells us. Um, but it's a, it's a fantastically good poem, and I think you will figure out what's going on in it very quickly um, because of this speaker. It's a poem by, another poem by Robert Browning, who I seem to be on a Browning kick these days, but this is a poem called My Last Duchess. 
And it's set, and the head note says, the poem is set in Ferrara. <clears throat> That's my last duchess painted on the wall, looking as if she were alive. I call that piece a wonder now. Frau Pandolf's hands worked busily a day, and there she stands. Will it please you to sit and look at her? I said, Frau Pandolf, by design, for never read strangers like you, that pictured countenance, the depth and passion of its earnest glance, but to myself they turned, since none puts by the curtain I have drawn for you but I, and they seemed as if they would ask me, if they durst, how such a glance came to be. So not the first are you to turn and ask thus. Sir, t'was not her husband's presence only called that spot of joy into the duchess' cheek. Perhaps Fra Pandolf had chanced to say, her mantle laps over my lady's wrist too much, or paint may never hope to reproduce the faint half-flush that dies along her throat. Such stuff was courtesy, she, th she thought, and cause enough for calling up that spot of joy. She had a heart, how shall I say, too soon made glad, too easily impressed. She liked where'er she looked on, and her looks went everywhere. Sir, t'was all one, my favor at her breast, the dropping of the daylight in the west, the bough of cherries some officious fool broke in the orchard for her, the white mule she rode with round the terrace, all and each would draw from her alike the approving speech, or blush at least. She thanked men, good, but thanked somehow, I know not how, as if she ranked my gift of a 900-year-old's name with anybody's gift. Who'd stoop to blame this sort of trifling? Even had you skill in speech, which I have not, to make your will quite clear to such a one and say, just this or that in you disgust me, here you miss or there exceed the mark. And if she let herself be lessened so, nor plainly set her wits to yours, forsooth, and made excuse, even then would be some stooping, and I choose never to stoop. Oh, sir, she smiled, no doubt, whene'er I passed her, but who passed without much the same smile? This grew, I gave commands, then all smiles stopped together. There she stands as if alive. Will it please you to rise? We'll meet the company below then. I repeat, the count your master's no munificence is ample warrant that no just pretense of mine for dowry will be disallowed, though his fair daughter's self, as I avowed at starting, is my object. Nay, we'll go down together, sir. Notice Neptune, though, taming a seahorse, thought a rarity, which Claus of Inbrook cast in bronze for me. You gotta love a character like that. That would be stooping, and I choose never to stoop. <laughs> okay, one short poem to finish. Um, it's not really a narrative poem in the same way we've been reading them, but it's such a great poem, and I came across it the other day, and I thought, well, I'm going to throw it in here as a coin because it's a great poem. Um, it's by a woman named Ellen Bass, who's a contemporary British poet. <clears throat> and I think we'll all, we all appreciate the sentiment of it, especially pandemic-wise. It's called Don't Expect Applause. Don't expect applause, and yet, wouldn't it be welcome at the end of each ordinary day? The audience could be small, the theater modest, folding chairs in a church basement would do. Just a short, earnest burst of applause that you got up that morning, and one way or another made it through the day. You soaked up in the steaming shower, drank your Starbucks in the car, and let the guy with the Windex wipe your windshield during the long red light at Broad Street. Or maybe you were that guy, not daring to light up while you stood there because everyone's so down on smoke these days. Or you kissed your wife as she hurried out the door, even though you were pretty sure she was meeting her lover at the Flamingo Motel, even though you wanted to grab her by a hank of her sleek hair. Maybe your son's in jail, your daughter stopped eating, and your husband's still dead this morning just like he was yesterday and the day before that. And yet you put on your shoes and take a walk, and when a neighbor says good morning, you say good morning back. Would a round of applause be amiss? Even if you weren't good and you yelled at your kids, poisoned the ants, drank too much, and said that really stupid thing you promised yourself you wouldn't say, even if you don't deserve it. Okay. Thank you. I read poems. <laughs> <laughs>